Hi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is you're watching this, and as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to edition 45 of Left Side of the Aisle. Uh, this is for the week of uh, February, um, what is it, 19th to the 22nd? Uh, to the, I'm sorry, that's completely wrong. It's for the week of February 23rd to 29th, and happy uh, Leap Year Day. Apparently, Leap Year got me all confused. Uh, 22nd to the 29th. Uh, I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson, and for the next almost half hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things important to me, I think deserve your attention, deserve to be important to you as well. As always, any comments or reactions to the show, any news tips, anything like that, can be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, whoviating at AOL.com. Uh, and if you didn't catch that, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up here somewhere during the course of the show a couple of times. And you can get the email address directly from there. If you do email me, I only ask that you include something uh, in the subject line, like your show or left side of the aisle or something, so I know it's not spam. And um, be a little patient. I do answer my mail, but sometimes a little slow about it. All right, I got a bunch of things to get through today. I actually had intended to do a rather long piece, um, but I've decided to put that aside. It wasn't prepared well enough, but to sort of give you a quick preview of it. I think I've actually talked about this before, but it would bear repeating that there's, um, we're losing our commons. Um, the commons in this sense being the sense of having a shared society, a shared community where uh, in which each of us has responsibilities and duties to and for each other. Uh, and I think that sense of community is being deliberately shattered by people who feel they can gain. But that's going to be left aside. I will get to that. Uh, I'm going to start today with a couple of, for lack of a better term, quick hits. A couple of things. I'm only going to spend two or three minutes on each of them. But um, a couple of quick items I wanted to make sure he got in. The first one is that the Supreme Court has given another victory to corporations looking to control the outcome of elections. In December, the state Supreme Court of Montana upheld a century-old state law that banned corporate uh, donations to election campaigns in the state. Uh, the law was passed in the wake of clear evidence that the copper barons were trying to basically literally buy elections. Um, the point is then that this law was not based on any uh, hypothetical uh, influence of money in elections, it was based on their actual experience. Well, the Supreme Court has now suspended that ruling uh, until, or until the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, makes a final ruling on uh, whether or not this law violates the notorious Citizens United decision. The result is that corporations can now spend unlimited amounts of money, spend as much as they want in the state primary, which is June 5th, and in November, general elections as well, since no one expects the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, to make a ruling before then. So again, another victory for the corporations. Uh, there's actually one rather bitterly amusing side note to this. Um, the article that was, the, the news article that was the source for this information said the court's order, and I'm quoting here, cleared the way for corporations, unions, and other groups to spend unlimited amounts of money on ads and other political activities. Yeah, like unions and corporations are on an equal footing here. And as another footnote, this one sort of unhappily revealing. You know all those super PACs that are collecting all those unlimited amounts of money for uh, the presidential campaign this year? According to an analysis of their financial statements that was done by USA Today, just under 25% of the entire amount these PACs have raised have been donated by precisely five very rich people. Uh, Dallas industrialist Harold Simmons has donated $14.4 million. Las Vegas casino mogul Sheldon Adelson and his wife Miriam have donated $10 million, and he says he's prepared to donate scores of millions more. Houston home builder Bob Perry came up with $3.6 million, and Peter Thiel, who's a venture capitalist and co-founder of PayPal, uh, he put in $2.6 million, a mere piker in this arrangement. All right, that's one quick hit. Uh, another one. 
I talked about this two weeks ago, uh, that we are being lied, manipulated, and stampeded into a war with Iran, or more likely, uh, more aptly, a war on Iran. Uh, here we go again. February 16th, Senators Joe Lieberman, Lindsey Graham, and Bob Casey introduced a resolution that would give us a big hard shove down the road to war. Uh, in order to, it's a sense of the Senate resolution, which um, seeks to move the goalposts for what would spark a war, uh, which is, that's informally called the red line, the point which if you cross, it would uh, provoke a U.S. military strike. Well, the Obama administration says that its red line is if Iran develops a nuclear weapon. This resolution wants to move that red line to a nuclear weapons capability. In other words, Iran does not have to build a nuclear weapon to provoke a U.S. military strike. It doesn't even have to be trying to build a nuclear weapon to provoke a U.S. military strike. It only needs to have the hypothetical capability of building one if it actually chose to do it. A capability that it may, in fact, by some arguments, already have. So this is basically a resolution for war. Now, this resolution has 36 co-sponsors, including 15 Democrats. And by the way, one of the Republican co-sponsors is Scott Brown, our moderate senator. Now, it is a sense of the Senate resolution. This, this is not legally binding. It's, in effect, a, an expression of opinion. But these kind of resolutions, especially when they're sponsored and pushed by AIPAC, the rather notorious pro-Israel powerful lobby, um, resolutions pushed by AIPAC have a habit of reappearing as binding laws, in which case senators are like, well, how can you vote against something that you already said should be done? All right, the last quick hit here. There are disturbing signs that the U.S. intelligence community uh, is coming to regard the loosely lit network of hackers known as anonymous as terrorists. According to the Wall Street Journal, the director of the National Security Agency, the NSA, his name is General Keith Alexander, he has been telling high-level audiences that Anonymous will soon have the capability of launching a cyber attack to bring about a power outage. Meanwhile, according to the article, U.S. intelligence officials have lumped Anonymous together with Al-Qaeda and Chinese and Russian uh, cyber spies to form a new cyber axis of evil, in effect. Uh, they also, by the way, these intelligence officials also refer to Anonymous as a stateless group, which is a description in intelligence ease that is normally applied to terrorist organizations. Apparently, WikiLeaks is not the only organization uh, that presents a mortal threat to the American way of secrecy, life of secrecy. Okay, enough with that. I'm going to move on to our uh, weekly feature, the outrage of the week. This again, this involves the Supreme Court. Uh, you know about the famous Miranda warning. This is, you know, you have the right to remain silent, so on and so forth, that warning. It grew out of a U.S. Supreme Court decision in 1966 about the police questioning of a man named Ernesto Miranda. Now, despite claims at the time and since that this would tie the hands of police and lead to mountains of crime as criminals get off scot-free on technicalities, the, the fact is most police forces have lived quite comfortably with it. And in fact, crime is actually down in those years since. Even so, even despite that, there have been uh, a number of attempts to limit or avoid or cut down the scope of Miranda. Uh, and those have met with some success in the courts. The big issue is that you don't need to be read your rights until you are in custody, which in legal terms, has come to understand the point at which a reasonable person would feel they are not free to end the questioning and simply leave. The issue is, where is that point and what constitutes a demonstration at that point? Okay, that's the background. There's this guy named Randall Lee Fields. Uh, he was in prison for 45 days on a disturbing the peace charge. 
While he was in prison, a jail guard and some sheriff's deputies took him from his cell, took him into a conference room, uh, supposedly told him several times he could leave if he wanted, and then proceeded to question him for seven hours about an allegation involving a sexual uh, assault on a minor. Fields eventually confessed. He was charged and convicted on this, sentenced to some 10 to 15 years in prison. Now, he appealed his conviction, or more properly, he appealed the use of his confession on the grounds that he wasn't given his Miranda rights on the sexual assault charge. The Sixth Federal Circuit Court of Appeals in Cincinnati agreed. They threw out the use of the confession and therefore the conviction, which means they could retry him, but they couldn't use the confession as evidence. The court ruled that police are required to read inmates their Miranda rights anytime they are isolated from the rest of the inmates in situations where they would be likely to incriminate themselves. On February 21st, the Supreme Court overturned that decision and reinstated the conviction. The court ruled that despite being in prison, Fields was not in custody for purposes of the Miranda rule, and therefore there was no need to tell him his rights. Writing for the majority, Justice Anton, uh, Justice, no, Sam Alito, said that, I'm quoting, imprisonment alone is not enough to create a custodial situation within the meaning of Miranda. Alito argued that questioning an inmate uh, doesn't produce the shock of arrest that a, a previously free person would, that there's no hope for a quick release if the inmate talks to police uh, like there might be for a free person. There's also no chance of a lighter sentence or any type of reprisal for not talking to the police because the person's already in prison. So what Alito argued in effect, and five of these great legal minds, the greatest legal minds of our nation, what these great legal minds agreed on was that if you're in jail for disturbing the peace, there is no shock involved in being hit with a charge of assault of a, a sexual assault of a minor. That there is no substantial difference between 45 days and 10 to 15 years. And that a prisoner alone in a room with a guard and some cops, feels entirely free to leave that room at any time and go back to their cell with absolutely no fear of any reprisals. These people are idiots. And their decision is the outrage of the week. And we're going to take a short break, and we'll be back in a few seconds. And just like Gene Autry, we're back in the saddle again. Uh, I haven't ter uh, talked about Occupy for some weeks now. Uh, I did get in that one mention, a quick, quick mention last week, which I'll get back to here, in fact. But um, I wanted to spend a little time, because I've, I've been neglecting it over time. Uh, and one of the reasons I wanted to talk about it is because, contrary to the impression you might gather from the, uh, our major media, the Occupy movement is not dead, far from it. Um, it just, what it is, it's no longer concentrated in encampments in large and medium-sized cities. So it's, um, it's not as media-friendly. They're not easy, convenient shots of masses of tents or clouds of tear gas. Um, so the media lost interest. But the movement is still out there. In fact, there are still encampments out there. There's still encampments out there. Uh, and cities and towns are still looking for various ways, whatever way they can find, in order to shut them down, make them shut up and go away. Uh, in fact, the, the city of Boise, Idaho, has had an encampment for a couple of months now. And uh, the city just passed a new emergency law to make it illegal to camp on public grounds. In other words, there was an occupation there. What they were doing was entirely legal. They could legally camp there. So what you do is you change the law. Uh, but even more than that, even more than the encampments, the thing is that Occupy has spread out. It has gone from those centralized encampments to sort of diffuse through those cities, out into the suburbs, even out into rural areas. And people are still out there. They're still demonstrating. They're still on the streets, still sitting in, still lobbying, still, you know, petitioning, still 
calling legislators, still carrying on and carrying it on in whatever way they as individuals feel that they can. Uh, there's a website called Fire Dog Lake. This just sort of is an illustration of this. Uh, they have a, um, a program they call Occupy Supply. This is where people go and they can donate money to provide supplies to various Occupy groups. Uh, um, and it's not just things like, you know, electronic equipment, for example, but it's actually more often been things like gloves and hats and insulated tents for encampments surviving the winter. Uh, and uh, if you want to know how to donate, email me, I'll tell you. The point here, the point of this is that Occupy Supply had this one big tent. It was like a $5,000 tent. I think they called it a command tent. They had one of them. And they wanted to donate it to the worthiest Occupy. And so they basically asked people involved in Occupy, nominate a, your, your local Occupy group. The requirement is you either have to have an ongoing encampment or you have to be actively involved. There has to be like recent actions that you are taking. Well, on January 31st, they posted, Fire Dog Lake posted its initial list of nominees. There were over 150 of them. Over 150 places in the country where there were either, there were encampments and or other activity related to the overall movement. In fact, just this week, just this past week, uh, you can see examples of the various tactics and the various methods and so on being used. Uh, for example, there were, there were hundreds of Occupy folks and uh, prison reform uh, advo uh, advocates. They rallied outside San Quentin prison. Uh, they charged that the state sentencing laws are too strict and they called for an end to solitary confinement, the death penalty, and trying children as adults. Some Occupy Oakland protesters got arrested when they uh, disrupted a foreclosure sale. Somebody's house had been foreclosed, was being sold. They disrupted the sale. Later on that same day, some other members of Occupy Oakland forced a local bank branch in, in Oakland to close early for the day because they were protesting the foreclosure on the house of an elderly woman who had been trying for three years to get a mortgage modification and getting nowhere. And there's a group calling itself Occupy the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, which just sent a 325-page letter containing detailed public comments on the proposed Volcker Rule to regulate bank transactions, to regulate the banks. More locally, Occupy Providence. Uh, it shut down voluntarily after the city agreed to its demand for a day center for homeless people. But it's reemerged as Occupy URI, University of Rhode Island. There's a teach-in schedule. They're putting up a, t a tent on the quad to symbolically represent uh, Occupy. And later in the month, they and other members of Occupy Rhode Island campuses. This is a coalition of five colleges and universities in Rhode Island. They're getting together to, for joint activities spread across the state. And in fact, there's apparently been some discussion among various Occupy groups about the possibility of moving occupations from downtowns to college, to college campuses. Uh, apparently the idea is if you can't settle in the street, camp on the campus. We'll see how that goes. Oh, and by the way, Occupy Maine now has its own TV show. Welcome to public TV, Occupy Maine. And on Wednesday, uh, February 29th, there are plans for nonviolent demonstrations in 60 cities across the country. The target here is ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. This is this right-wing group which brings together corporations and the right-wing and legis state legislators to come up with model bills to bring back to states to try to design to advance the corporate agenda. But I have to tell you, if you really want to know about the impact of a movement, you don't look at its friends, you look at its enemies. I mentioned this last week, but it bears repeating. On January 30th, just before the uh, Florida primary, Newt Grinch accused Witless Romney of being a tool of Wall Street. 
He also said that big banking firms like Goldman Sachs, they're rigging the game. And he claimed that the negative ads being run against him were being financed by Wall Street firms and Goldman Sachs. Now think of the impact involved when someone like Newt Grinch figures that accusing a fellow Republican of being a tool of Wall Street is something to his benefit. It's not enough, okay? How about the fact that Jamie Dimon, he's the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, he's made something of a career of late of making uh, um, hyperbolic, hyperventilating attacks on attempts to regulate the banks. He recently told uh, uh, New York Magazine that, yeah, we absolutely should raise taxes on rich people. He said, and I'm quoting, I don't think people should be able to pass unlimited amounts onto their kids. So much for the death tax. Still not enough? How about the fact that last Wednesday, February 17th, the Wall Street Journal said in an editorial that the only real way to prevent a repeat of the wild, irresponsible financial speculation and wrongful behavior that resulted in the financial meltdown that was the immediate cause for the mess that we're currently in. The only way to prevent that is, quoting here, a congressional plan either for allowing large banks to fail or for breaking them up. You heard that right. The Wall Street Journal wants to break up the banks. And finally, if you're still not convinced, this should be the clincher. This is one example of many. A recent column by a woman named Judith Samuelson. She's the executive director of the Aspen Institute's Business and Society Program. She said that Occupy should, and I'm quoting her, help give visibility to ideas that move beyond vilifying corporations and capitalism and begin to focus on the incentives and policies that create suboptimal results from business and capital markets. So... She's saying that what Occupy should do is just kind of like smooth out the rough edges on capitalism. The thing is, and this is just an example, a great way to measure the impact of any movement is to notice when people across the political spectrum seem to feel obliged to and free to offer that movement sage advice on what it should do. When everybody wants to give you advice, you know you've got something with power. All right, last thing here. Last thing we're going to do. Uh, our occasional feature and another thing. And another thing. Uh, this is our occasional foray into things not directly political, usually involves some cool science. In this case, almost literally so. Uh, but to do this, what I have to do is I want you to take down the logo and there's a picture. Put up that picture. Um, and it's a picture, obviously, of a plant. It's a plant. The scientific name of this plant is, is Celine Stenophylla. It's, um, this picture is of a live plant. It's fertile. It's got lacy white flowers. It's got viable seeds. This was grown from seeds found in immature fruit in a squirrel's burrow that, with a lot of fruit and, and seeds in it. What makes this burrow special and what makes these seeds and this plant special is that that burrow had been frozen in the Siberian permafrost for over 30,000 years. This is, by more than an order of magnitude, the oldest plant ever regenerated. Uh, the previous oldest seeds ever produce a viable plant were, by comparison, only 2,000 years old. These seeds are 15 times older. This is not only major cool, you'll, no pun intended. It shows that ancient life forms, ancient DNA, can survive in the ice for thousands, even tens of thousands of years, shades of the X-Files. But that, in turn, opens up the possibility of resurrecting other life forms. Uh, now, the fact that these seeds were found uh, in the same strata with the bones of large animals, large mammals, not only things like bison, horse, and deer, but also woolly rhinoceros and woolly mammoths. It's got some people dreaming of the possibility of resurrecting, that is, of having an actual live, walking around, eating, drinking, uh, woolly mammoth. Now, that's not possible now. Uh, the necessary cloning technology is still too iffy, and the fact is we lack 
sufficient intact DNA. So no, no Jurassic Park is on the horizon, not even the dim horizon, not if, if you ignore the, the slight time differential between mammoths and dinosaurs of about 60 million years. But is it possible that in the foreseeable future, we could possibly have a mammoth walking around? Well, depending on the breaks, and the real break is probably finding the DNA necessary, um, that may be the biggest hurdle. But is it possible? Yes, it is. And that is really cool. All right, one last quick thing. Another anniversary, one which I missed. Monday, February 20th, was the 50th anniversary of the day that John Glenn took off in a Redstone rocket to become the first American to orbit the Earth. Looking back on it from this distance, I mean, I remember sitting in school and seeing this being televised, a gathering in the classrooms to see this televised. And um, it's hard to actually remember that um, it was just seven and a half years later, in July of 1969, that we actually had somebody standing on the moon. All right, that's it for me for this week. How much time have I got left? I got two whole minutes. Well, that's cool. So what I'm going to do is tell you again that uh, this is, remember, this is public access TV. Um, down here, this is, this. you know, I'm doing the show because I decided I wanted to do a show. And I came down here, and the folks have been very helpful. They've done a lot of, a lot of work for me. They've really helped me out. If you have something you want to do, you come on down here. These people will help you. Um, you have an idea. You think that uh, a hobby, an interest, maybe a, a political point of view, maybe you have expertise on something, um, maybe you want to interview. I don't know. Whatever it is you want to do, just remember that public access means that. It is public. That's the whole point of it. It is the public. You are the public. This is for you. This is your alternative to the corporate media. This is your alternative. Because one of the things that has been shown by things like public access, by things like YouTube, are that people will watch. People do want to see things. They don't have to have million dollar or 10 or 100 million dollar special effects in order for something to be worth watching. Public TV is here. It's your TV. You take advantage of it. Okay, I'm going to wrap up with that. You just have the best week you possibly can. And um, we will see you next week. All right? Hang in there. Bye.